from KZ12. The night beat starts right now. They offer an opportunity to capture confrontations between police and the public. Body cameras and the footage they hold sometimes released within days in some Texas towns. Why isn't San Antonio following suit? A look at the discovery during a months long defenders investigation coming up. But first new tonight, her throat punctured, her stomach stabbed. Police say the woman was found at a bus stop on Southwest Military near South Flores Street. The man accused in the case was caught a couple of blocks away. The woman was taken to the hospital with life threatening injuries. Investigators say an argument led to the stabbing, but no word on an exact motive tonight. Officers suspect both the man and the woman we're homeless. It's a story we've been following all day, and we have some new video in during that standoff in North Bear County. As we said, we've been following the story since five o'clock. It looks like that's the suspect coming out in the red shirt, getting on his knees, getting on the ground and surrendering. A man barricaded in a home where another man was found dead. The Bear County Sheriff says the two men were related. This all happened in a neighborhood northeast of Bulverde Road in TPC Parkway. Bear County deputies on the scene for hours. Tonight team's Jaffney Gray spoke with neighbors who watched it all unfold in the Whistling Acres neighborhood. I just heard that someone was barricaded themselves inside, so it was really nerve wracking to hear in the neighborhood. Take a look at your screen. Here you see a man exiting this home on Whistling Acres with his hands held high, surrendering peacefully to Bear County Sheriff's deputies. Deputies were called to the home after a neighbor said they found a man in his 40s dead inside. Sheriff Javier Salazar said the victim had multiple stab wounds and had been dead for some time. We believe it was at least several hours, but it, it could be possible that, that it could have been several days. Deputies learned the suspect, a man in his 20s, was armed inside of the house, so they retreated. They were talking to him for some time. They were able to determine that at this point it seems like he's uh, got some mental health issues, uh, but they were able to negotiate with him, get him to at some point throw what we believe to be the murder weapon out of the house. Neighbors say they were shocked something like this happened so close to home. It's very family based. There's a lot of families here. Um, I, I was just driving to work and then that's when I saw a cop just cautioning everything. And I saw down Bulverde Road, a bunch of cops. They say they are grateful nobody else was hurt or killed during the arrest. To be able to get someone that's in distress like that out of the house is really a difficult job. And I think that they made the neighbors feel secure and they blocked off what they needed to and got the job done. Now, at this time, an ID hasn't been released for the suspect or the victim in this case. Salazar says that the suspect's mental health state will be evaluated. So far, a murder charge is expected. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. New on the night, a, det a detention officer finds herself off the job and behind bars. Ashley Morales was employed at the Guadalupe County Adult Detention Center. Now she is facing a sex charge involving someone who was in custody or supervision. Morales was arrested today and booked at the Guadalupe County Jail on a $50,000 bond. Guadalupe County Sheriff Arnold Zwicky says she was terminated upon her arrest. Across Texas and the nation, police shootings are under fire with much of the public wanting more transparency from officials when an officer shoots and kills a person. The result? Major Texas cities now release dashboard and body worn camera video, sometimes within days of these deadly encounters. But in San Antonio, no such policy exists and police accountability experts say that's a problem. During a months long investigation, the night team's Dylan Collier looked at the guidelines of other law enforcement agencies and why SAPD hasn't followed suit. It's tonight's Defenders Report. In June 2019, San Antonio police found Tomas Hernandez on a downtown highway overpass. SAPD officers stopped him from jumping but shot him six times in the process, killing the 35-year-old after he reached for a weapon. The person drew that weapon, officers believing it to be a gun, it was a knife. Even though footage of Hernandez's shooting death exists, it's unlikely the public will ever see it. Why? It turns out a state law allows city officials to keep it hidden since the case did not result in a criminal conviction for any of the officers involved. 
I believe that the public has an absolute right to see that footage as soon as possible. An attorney by trade, Merrick Bob has helped some of the country's largest police departments manage the risks of officer misconduct, dating back to the aftermath of the Rodney King beating nearly 30 years ago. Holding back because you don't like what that information shows doesn't help you at all in the long run. An examination by the defenders found that the Dallas, Arlington, Fort Worth, and Austin police departments have all adopted policies. Put your hands up, show me your hands. That call for footage to be released after officers shoot someone. In the Metroplex, that video is made public within days. Put your hands up, you now. Austin's new protocol, the most stringent of the four, was published in June amidst protests there and across the United States and came weeks after Austin police officers shot and killed Mike Ramos. Impact him! APD's guidelines call for it to now publish videos like this within 60 days. And if they can't, they must explain why within 45 days of the shooting taking place. Austin 911. Video of Ramos's death, which included 911 audio and a narration from a lieutenant with the department, was released three months after the shooting and while the officers were still being investigated. I think this is one of the most difficult questions in contemporary policing. But it's a question St. Mary's Law professor Gary Ramey says can't be ignored. Mario, I just said I'm not taking questions. So and it may help explain what has played out in recent months in Houston, which like San Antonio, does not yet have a policy specific to footage of police shootings. After HPD officers shot and killed six people in five weeks, Chief Art Acevedo in June held an intense press conference that included family members of people killed by officers. The loved ones explained one by one why they wanted the footage kept out of the public eye. Once these videos are released, it, they go on these websites for generations of families to see. But months after Acevedo put his arm around the widow of Nicholas Chavez as she pleaded for police video of her husband's death to not come out. The videos you are about to see are graphic. The chief reversed course. And while announcing the firing of four officers who responded to the call the night Chavez was killed, he also released footage showing them shooting Chavez more than 20 times. Experts we spoke with say policies for releasing footage of officers shooting suspects will undoubtedly be revised in the years to come. But to not have one in the works, at least at this point, they say is almost unbelievable. The San Antonio Police Department has 2,200 officers that a department that size, the seventh biggest city in the United States, and at this point, no policy for releasing footage after an officer shoots and kills a person. It's very surprising to me, and I would encourage that chief to look across the country at other practices of departments that are doing quite well with this and really building strong trust. Chief William McManus did not respond to our repeated request for an interview about SAPD's lack of a policy, but it appears his department will have no choice but to take up the issue. Earlier this month, Mayor Ron Nuremberg called for a complete review of SAPD's body-worn camera policies in order to improve transparency, accountability, and public accessibility. Are you surprised that SAPD had nothing on the books prior till now, specifically for footage of officer shootings? I'm a little surprised, and we have these very high-profile events. There's a lot of conflicting uh, accounts that really can only be settled uh, once there is uh, some viewing of uh, video. Nuremberg's memo came a day after an SAPD officer shot and killed Daryl Zamalt Sr. in front of his west side home. Police say Zamalt had been named in several domestic violence reports by an ex-girlfriend and struggled over an officer's gun after they tried to take him into custody. Police video of Zamalt's death has not been made public. If you can't release it to the family while you're out here painting this narrative and controlling what you, what you would like to paint this person out to be, then you're not protecting and serving. And so I ask, who are you protecting and who are you serving? I think the days of police hunkering down and saying, too bad, you're not gonna get it, we don't have to kind of a game, those days are gone. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Many of these shooting videos released by other departments include redactions, blurring of sensitive footage, and even high-ranking officers describing to viewers what they're about to see. Law professor Ramey says that can be problematic as an agency may try to spin what is shown in their favor. Coming up later in the show, what does the head of the San Antonio Police Officers Union think of body cam footage being released sooner? Our live interview with Detective Mike Helley later in this show.
It is one of the most disturbing cases he's seen in his 20 years of practice. Guadalupe County Attorney Dave Wilburn describing a case where a woman lived with the body of her mother as it decomposed for years. The story we've been following since bones were found in the bedroom of a home in Seguin last year. Delissa Creighton is now spending 30 years in prison. Investigators say her mother had fallen in the home in 2016, but Creighton did not seek medical attention. Instead, she allowed her mother to die and the body to rot, all while Creighton's daughter lived in the home. The trial of accused cop killer Otis McCain set to resume next month. The 31 year old is accused of shooting veteran SAPD detective Benjamin Marconi as he sat in his patrol car in 2017. The trial was put on hold in March due to the pandemic. Now jury selection will resume on October 26. But testimony is not expected until next year. McCain was charged with capital murder and the DA announced they would seek the death penalty. We've got an update now on the coronavirus pandemic here at home. The wording on the risk level bar changed from safe to low risk for the green section. It's a change they made today, and that's where we stand tonight. Our seven day average is dipped below 150 and our positivity rate also moving down to 5.9%. The goal is to get that to 5% or under. Right now we have 220 COVID-19 patients in the hospital. No new deaths were reported today. Still ahead on the night beat, the first presidential debate set to happen tomorrow. What's happening hours before each candidate takes the stage? Coming up. And parents at Northside ISD now faced with a decision on how to continue the school year. As some voice concerns, the district laying out safety plans in place. It's next on the night beat. One hundred and fifty million rapid COVID-19 tests are set to be deployed to the U.S. with the most vulnerable communities receiving them first. The U.S. is averaging 40,000 COVID-19 cases a day, but some areas are scaling back their shutdowns. Florida's governor essentially lifted most restrictions in the state. Many bars there have been packed. Authorities in New York City threatening to lock down some neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens because of a recent surge in cases. Tonight, Texas and more than 30 other states and Puerto Rico are battling a rising number of infections. Well, here at home, parents at Northside ISD faced with a decision to keep their students at home or change course and go back into the classroom. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke to parents who are making that decision this week. My wife picked her up from school and she said she talked the entire way home uh, about, about her day. Jeff Webb has three kids at Northside ISD. His daughter, who is in second grade, started in-person learning today. I think the district's done a great job of putting protocols in place to make parents feel safe about the environment they're returning their kids to. Brittany Glenn says her eight-year-old son, who is in third grade, will continue to learn virtually. I'm high risk. I am not in a position to be around people who may have COVID symptoms. And so my job has allowed me to work from home. Um, and I, it's, it's worked out really well for us that I'm able to be here to help him. Um, but we're just, we're just not ready. The second quarter of school begins October 19th, but parents must notify the district whether their child will do in-person or virtual learning through a survey by midnight on Wednesday. The district says they are prepared for more students. We have extra masks for students, some washable, reusable, some the throw away. We have gloves, we have face shields, um, everything for teachers, whatever is needed, we have it and we can provide it to them. The district says more than 11,000 students are doing in-person learning. Everybody has to do what's right for their family. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's check live cam tonight. Sky 12 flowing, flying over the Tower Life Building. Almost said flowing over the Tower Life <laughs> the Building. I was, I was looking at the flag, yeah, the flag flowing, flowing and I got yeah. I got my descriptors messed up. And it's a beautiful night out there. It's too. awesome. It's gorgeous outside. Yeah, beautiful 73, low humidity and that flag is flowing. We're seeing some wind out there, but the winds have really died down from earlier today. In fact, right now we're only seeing a wind for the north at about 
10 miles per hour rather than 40 miles per hour earlier. That's how high wind gusts were. I want to show you the time lapse and just how much uh, this camera was shaking today because of those winds. The high temperature, 80 degrees, that actually occurred at 3 in the morning, 328 in the morning before we saw the front move through. So the high was a morning high temperature and then that low of 68 was right after the front had moved through closer to dawn. Uh, that's when we saw temperatures dip down into the 60s and we've kind of been coasting in the 70s ever since. But I mentioned those gusty winds. Here's a look at the top wind gusts since this morning around the KSAT 12 viewing area officially at the airport 41 mile per hour wind gust. Yeah, that's going to send the garbage can you left outside over the weekend across the street or potentially even some outdoor decorations or some light patio furniture. But thankfully winds have died down. Look at that Hondo maximum wind gusts of 44 miles per hour. To put that in perspective for you, a severe wind gust is about 58 miles per hour, so not too much off of that. That's pretty impressive. Like I said, winds have died down. They are from the north at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. This is going to help our temperatures go down quite a bit. If we had windy conditions all night long, uh, that would keep our temperatures up, but with calming winds, that's going to allow our temperatures to fall. We are still seeing clouds hang on, however, so I did bump up the morning temperatures a little bit, but we're seeing uh, breaks in these mid level clouds and by the start of the day tomorrow morning we'll have clear skies right now outside it's 73 uh, at the airport 66 in Kerrville 64 in Rock Springs. Those are the areas that could potentially be in the 40s by the start of the day tomorrow and it is noticeably dry outside chapstick weather over the next few days with that wind from the north. We're going to continue to see dry air filtering in uh, the humidity isn't going to return for a few days. In fact, it, it'll only be humid by Sunday. That's when we'll notice the mugginess. Until then, it's going to be pleasant with low humidity every day, ample sunshine, just a beautiful forecast over the next uh, about seven to ten days, honestly. So like I said, tomorrow morning, some places may be in the 50s early tomorrow morning, uh, in the 40s rather early tomorrow morning. I think Kerrville could dip down to about 49, 50 degrees. Around San Antonio, 55 for the start of the day tomorrow. Uh, and it's it should be in the mid to upper 50s just about everywhere around the KSAT 12 viewing area, but then it's going to quickly warm up. This is a look at afternoon high temperatures, so we go from about 55 to almost 30 degrees warmer in the low 80s for the high temperature. How is that possible? Well, we're going to have dry air and tons of sunshine tomorrow. That's a good recipe to see temperatures rise. So a chilly start. If you want to go for that morning run or that morning walk, it's going to be perfect for that. You might want to dress in layers though tomorrow because like I said, in the the afternoon it'll be warm winds could gust up to 20 miles per hour from the north so breezy but definitely not as windy as today and then it'll cool quickly in the evening mornings are going to be great this week we're going to wake up just about every day with temperatures in the 50s or near 60 degrees and on top of that look at all the sunshine in the forecast now if you're worried about rain yeah it would be nice to see some rain there on the seven day forecast but we're doing pretty good in the rain department we've seen more than three inches of rain for the month of september We've seen more than what we usually see. So again, I think we've got a surplus of rain, so it, it's good to have a nice, relaxing, comfortable fall feeling week mm. ahead. Yes, it is. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right. The Dallas Cowboys, they, they do not have a good track record in Seattle. You know what? The one question I would hate to have to answer if I was a head coach of any team. Coach, what one positive did you take out of this loss? Yeah. We got home. That yeah. would be the only thing I yeah. can think of, right? But I'm in the media. I'm not a coach. So what is the one bright spot the Cowboys can take out of their loss in Seattle? We will show you. And we have an update on the UTSA quarterback who was injured in their last game coming up. Pro football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. After giving up 412 yards of total offense and five touchdowns for Russell Wilson, Cowboy fans have been screaming for Dallas to sign Earl Thomas. Safety was cut by the Baltimore Ravens, uh, punching out a teammate most recently, and before that, chasing down Cowboys coach Jason Garrett to the locker room, telling Garrett to sign him at the time. But get this, the Cowboys in-state rivals may beat them to the punch, as ESPN reports. They're bringing Thomas in for a workout and expect to sign him this week. Frustrating to say the least for Cowboys. Dak Prescott is through for 472 yards, three touchdowns in the Cowboys 38-31 loss, becoming the first Cowboys quarterback to have back-to-back -back games of 400 yards or more in team history. One silver lining to the loss is that Alden Smith is now leading the NFL in sacks with a total of 
five. Three coming against Wilson alone on Sunday. Not bad for a guy who hasn't played a down of football since 2015. Rushing him is a, is a team effort for sure, especially with this quarterback. So um, if it wasn't for the other guys playing their roles and, and doing things, then um, it would have been a much tougher for me to get to make some plays out there. Up next for the one and two Cowboys are the Cleveland Browns who have, get this, a better record than the Cowboys. They're now two and one. Kickoff Sunday at AT&T Stadium except for noon. The Houston Texans are one of six teams in the NFL who are winless in the first three games of the season. That's after they were shut out in the second half and lost to the Steelers in Pittsburgh 28 to 21 on Sunday. But remember, it's not the first time the Texans have opened a season 0 and 3 under head coach and now general manager Bill O'Brien. It was just 2018 when they went 0 and 3 and went on to win 11 of their next 13 games to finish the regular season 11 and 5 and make the playoffs. Does O'Brien see anything he can take from 2018 and apply it to this season? There's not much he can take from that year. Three different teams we opened up against that year. We've opened up against, you know, three very good teams and we just haven't, we haven't, uh, you, you know, obviously done enough to win any of those games. So, you know, we have to, we did a lot of things yesterday that were decent, but not enough. And we just have to really um, build on the things we're doing well and really correct the things we're not doing well. All right, up next for the Texans, maybe just what the doctor ordered, the winless Minnesota Vikings at NRG Stadium, where fans will be welcomed back at 20% capacity for the noon kickoff. Texas star quarterback Sam Ellinger summed up their overtime victory over Texas Tech and Lubbock on Saturday with these words. I feel like that's the perfect game for 2020. And you know why? Because it was so bizarre. Two block punch, two onside kick, the two-point conversion to tie, send the game into overtime. The Longhorns won at 63-56. That's right, it combined 119 points where Ellinger threw for five touchdowns. For that, he was named the Big 12 Offensive Player of the Week again. So what did Tom Herman learn about his defense? They gave up 56 points and 441 total yards. Our players on defense, they were embarrassed. You know, they, they watched the same video you watched and, and the same, they were part of the same game everybody else saw. And uh, they know that, that uh, they, they've got to tackle better. They, they won the game. They're happy they won the game. But they understand that, that we can't uh, accomplish our goals playing like that uh, each and every week. Next up for the ninth-ranked Longhorns TC at home on Saturday, and the kickoff time has now been set for 11 a.m. The latest update on UTSA star quarterback Frank Harris next. You can almost hear a collective sigh of relief coming from the UTSA campus today as Frank Harris's injury is a sprained right knee game-time decision, especially given his history with injuries over the last two seasons. Harris has brought down hard on his right knee on this play just before the end of the first half against Middle Tennessee. Stayed in the game, but on this pass play, two plays later, tried to limp back to the bench only to go down on the field. Former Smithson Valley quarterback Josh Atkins, who transferred from New Mexico State, took over from there and through for 233 yards, a touchdown to hold on to the 37-35 victory. Now a 3-0 start. So since it's a game time decision, how will the Roadrunners plan around both possibilities? They both have things they do well, and we'll, we'll, we'll do what those guys can do. And uh, if Frank's 100%, he'll go Saturday. And if he's not, then Josh will go. All right, congratulations to UTSA freshman linebacker Jamal Ligon, who has been named the Conference USA Defensive Player of the Week. If you broke the Roadrunners' single-game record with 19 tackles, it includes eight solos, one-and-a-half sacks, and he now becomes the fourth Roadrunner to be named the Conference USA Player of the Week, which matches the most in school history for an entire single season. Next up, the Roadrunners hit the road to face the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Saturday at 1130. Funeral services were held this morning at Cowboys Fellowship in Jordan for Sonny Detmer, who passed away this past Tuesday at the age of 76. The legend legendary high school football coach whose last stop was at Somerset High School. Coached both of his sons, Ty and Coy Detmer, in their high school careers. Ty would go on to win the Heisman while at BYU, and later both would have NFL careers that span 24 seasons. His greatest quality in every individual he came across was his ability to make someone feel better about who they were, and that's who Sonny Detmer was. He's an incredible man, and he will be missed. Yeah, he was more than a football coach. He was a father, a great husband, and, of course, a mentor to so, so many, not only just youngsters, but older people as well, fellow coaches. And a guy that you've come to know very well over the years. And I, allowed me to share some of his big family moments with him, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Up next, our case at Q&A with president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association, Detective Mike Helley, joins us after the break.
Welcome to our KSAT Q&A, where we strive to get different perspectives, different takes on issues that all of us face. And certainly policing and the possibility of policing reform, one of the major issues that every city across the country is facing, including San Antonio. And earlier in this show, our defenders investigator, Dylan Collier, uh, brought up the prospect of body cam footage being released sooner and why San Antonio didn't have a policy. We are joined now by the president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association, Detective Mike Kelly. Detective, thank you for joining us. Right off the top, your reaction to should San Antonio have a policy on releasing body cam footage? Are you talking about uh, the district attorney or us? Because I, we I, do have a policy. Yeah, well, the police department doesn't have a policy on when it should be released. I find that kind of odd since uh, the rank and file are continually brought into internal affairs to investigate body camera violations. So um, I, I would probably guess who said that they didn't have one because that would surprise me. Yeah, the city, the city of San Antonio does not have a body camera policy when they will release it to the public. Hmm. Well, I know that uh, not just San Antonio, but across the state of Texas, we're all bound by the state of Texas's uh, laws, right? So uh, the Occupation Code 1701, I think it's subsection N, outlines when um, a police department can release body camera footage and when they cannot. Um, and I want to, if I'm not mistaken, there is a stipulation in there that under special circumstances, the chief of police, he can um allow a family member or their designee to come in and observe the body camera footage, just say if it was on a high profile uh, shooting or something like that where their loved one was was killed. Um, the, the law allows the chief to make that that provision to take place. But outside of that, I'm, I'm, I'd be kind of surprised if there wasn't one. Um, but if you're telling me that there is, then I'll have to go back and follow up. If there isn't, then I have to go up and follow up with it. But they're certainly bound by law, which is written, and that's the policy. How, how does the rank and file feel about body cam footage being released? So you have to remember as far back as, uh, as 2016, SAPOA kind of led the charge on body cameras across the nation. Um, almost without question and hesitation, a lot of the agencies like myself, not agencies, but uh, organizations like ours um, was resisting body cameras. And uh, we decided to embrace it. And just as we predicted, uh, transition would take place where the ACLU and other groups would start to uh, start to complain that they didn't like body camera footage being taken by the police. As a matter of fact, now today they are complaining that um, that we're holding on to the body camera too long, body camera footage too long, and they want us to dispose of it sooner. And they do not like us uh, of uh, all the video that's being captured, especially for a lot of uh, a lot of their clientele. But SAPO was on the forefront. We embraced it. Uh, we uh, we know that uh, on a lot of the circumstances that it will exonerate our officers, and that was one of the primary purposes why um, we chose not to resist it. You, you, you mentioned that exonerating officers, and in some cases this video is crucial. It's so critical in determining whether or not an officer acted appropri appropriately. What is what is a reasonable timeline for you? What When do you think... <clears throat> that video should be released. As we mentioned in our Defenders report earlier, a lot of Texas cities do it within days. For you, your position on this, when do you think that should be released? So I, I, so it's, well, one, it's not up to any particular person that should be, that should, that decision should be made to. There needs to be a, a, a cumulative decision based upon different aspects of it. So depending upon what happened, um, you release the body camera footage too early, it could taint a possible grand jury. Um, it also could hurt your investigation. If you're looking for eyewitnesses to an event um, and you want real eyewitnesses and not eyewitnesses that are coming forward after they saw the body camera footage, um, those, those are very particular. There's crucial when it comes to investigation in our profession, especially when it comes to district attorney's office, when they're trying to impanel a grand jury or, or at least during a jury trial, they don't want to um, uh, prejudice any kind of the community when you have repeated video coverage over and over and over the same thing. Um, the same thing kind of applies when they read in the newspaper and other, other kind of news out. They ask you when, if you've ever had to serve on a jury, whether or not uh, um, you can be fair and impartial after seeing all this. But um, we're not objecting to releasing any of the body camera footage as long as it is legal to do so and it's practical to do so. And if it doesn't hinder or, or, or jeopardize our investigation, as well as there are other people that are involved in this process, too, because 
not not just the actor that's involved in the police, but you have a victim that's also part of this too, right? So you have to be sensitive to the nature of how you're going to release body camera footage and take into consideration for the victim as well as potential the witnesses additional. Talk, let's, let's shift gears here and talk a little bit about collective bargaining. When the city council passed the latest city budget, you applauded the fact that they did not cut funds from the San Antonio Police Department, but you also issued a warning that the next thing that you feel um, activists on the other side of this issue are going to come for is collective bargaining. Why do you think it's so important that collective bargaining stay in place? Well, for, for one, I think that these groups are being kind of short-sighted in what it does as, as a whole to, for our city. And I, and I wish that they were uh, communicating a little bit more with other people that this is going to be directly involved in as far as um, uh, community aspect, not just on their side of the house, but other people in the community too, how it's going to affect them. Because if you ask a majority of people in San Antonio, um, they don't want to defund the police and they want their police officers to be uh, plentiful and to be out there in their neighborhoods. Because when you repeal collective bargaining, whether or not they want to admit it or not, it is another form of repeal, it's another form of defund. Um, and that's just a sad fact of reality. Um, because when all your benefits go away and all your wages uh, are no longer applicable because of a contract that's no longer going to exist anymore, well, that's another form of defunding the police. Um, but systematically, you'll see across if that does happen, and the citizens have the right to vote on this up or down, and I would hope that they have confidence in our police force and our department to, to act swiftly and appropriately on, on discipline issues um, that are raising concern by this other group. But um, you got your AAA bond rating would be affected by it. Uh, you have your pension fund would long term would have an impact on it. You have a retiree health care fund would most definitely feel an impact on it. That's serving our retirees, both fire and police. Um, the list can go on and on. And certainly the most important, most important one is service of the community would certainly be affected because um, nobody is going to want to work for less money from one day to the next. And you're going to have probably about 750 officers that are eligible to retire today if they had to. Um, and there's no way that you can fill that void uh, overnight. It certainly would take, if you look at the cadet classes that were canceled in 2012, 2013, and 14 by the, our previous city manager, we're just now today in 2020 digging ourselves out of the hole that we were put in for canceling cadet classes back then. And that that's, tells you kind of how long it takes uh, to kind of get the rank and file back up to where they need to be. But across the board, it would be detrimental um, uh, for that to kind of happen. But I can assure you that uh, SAPOA has been at the forefront of reform. And this is not any like any other challenge that we've had to deal with. And like I said previously in 08, when I was uh, elected president under the first contract, we dealt with issues uh, regarding it would take days uh, on end to have uh, people when they call the police <clears throat> to um, process their crime scenes or the burglary of their house or their or their vehicles that were broken into. Uh, we recognize that as an issue and we developed a program that would uh, we call it the uniform evidence detective, which is a dual purpose employee. Not only is a detective, but he's also a patrolman as well to make those encounters a lot more swiftly and, and, and more accurately be taken care of on a, on a timely basis as well as creating a fourth shift um, that that put more police officers during the highest peak call times during our call load responses to the city. Mm -hmm. And it was SAPOA that brought these um, initiatives to the table. It wasn't the city. And then on this last contract, when it was healthcare was the most important issue on the table, it was SAPOA again driving the message and driving the, the facts home. And even today, um, at the end of the day, we it was our policy and healthcare plan that was uh, is what we have on our contract, and we are saving the city on the life of this contract somewhere upwards north of uh, 75 to 78 million. On, on the subject of collective of collective bargaining, though, the argument has been made that police union contracts make it more difficult to hold officers accountable. That if you come across a bad officer, it is harder to discipline them because of these police union contracts. What is your response to that argument? Well, I think that's completely false. Um, that is completely within the chief of, the, uh, of police's authority to um, to deal with officers throughout their entire careers. He's the one that hires them. He's the one that sets the policies and, and what the standards need to be when he's hiring them. He, uh, they go through psychological exams before they're hired. 
They have a year probationary period that if there are things that are found before they before they are off of probation, they can be terminated at will without any question at all. And throughout their entire careers, the chief has the at his discretion, the authority to have anybody investigated for any misgivings that or, or assumed uh, misgivings that uh, that they may be have committed. And it's with his authority to punish them as well. The only thing that our contract lays out is a due process. And, and that has been a staple for all of of, uh, of our society since the, since the 1700s when we were developed as a, as a nation in the very beginning, it was about due process. And that's all that our contract does. And that's all we've ever asked for is due process. And, and speaking of that- It's um, the arbitration process though, where things get murky, where it's not as easy as the chief saying, I think this person should be let go and it happens. Well, statistically that argument's not supported because in the last 10 years, we've only had 23 cases go to arbitration. And out of those 23 cases, the chief wins 57% of the time. And the, the, the members who return their jobs back only receive 43% of the time. But it's important to know what that number actually is. It's only 10 officers have been returned to, uh, um, out of the 70, that, I think it's 71 that he terminated over the 10 year period, only 10 have been returned through arbitration. So. I think it's important when you look at and we throw out uh, concerns and issues that we delve into what the real reality of it is and not not on some mythical uh, that this is some in, that the right. chief is powerless to terminate people, which uh, is completely within his right to do so. Um, just that the arbitration process is just an independent person who is uh, has no um, uh, um reason to choose one side or the other and the, and the department has to lay out their facts yeah. and the member has to lay out his but there are statistics out there that show that's not it's not that low that it's something near 67 percent want that not necessarily get it back through arbitration but get it back after filing arbitration so you have to recall too and it was you guys that put it out that uh, it it's it, it, it's only, you can't mix apples and oranges, and that's what that's what uh, you guys have done. Yeah, and yeah. that is the 20. Uh, so out of 71, 20 officers were reinstated without going through the contract, without going to arbitration. The chief decided to bring them back on his own, and that's within his authority to do so. But you and know that there's like there's gray in there. It's not it's not black yeah. and white. They, just because they were reinstated doesn't mean that the chief want. I mean, it could have been a long drawn out process. It could have cost the city more money than they wanted to. So, I mean, we can argue about the numbers, but I'm just I, what I really wanted to know is how you feel about the arbitration process and collective bargaining and why you think it's so important that it stays in place instead of getting lost in statistics that you know, we can argue back and forth on till, you know, this time tomorrow night, probably. Oh, so and we certainly want to thank you so much for your time. We're all out of time. Detective Mike Kelly with the San Antonio Police Officers Association. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Sure. We'll be right back. We are less than 24 hours from the first presidential debate. Tonight, taking center stage, renewed scrutiny of the president's taxes. ABC's Alex Prache has the latest. Tomorrow, President Trump and Joe Biden on the stage together for the first time. No handshakes, no opening statements. Biden anticipating fireworks. He's going to want to make it personal. He's going to want to get in the mosh pit. Almost certain to come up in the debate, this bombshell investigation from the New York Times, detailing information on nearly two decades worth of the president's federal tax returns. Data Trump has repeatedly refused to release, citing an IRS audit. The Times reporting the president paid no federal income taxes in 11 of the 18 years it reviewed. In 2016, the year he won the White House, and the year after, he paid just $750. The president reportedly had write-offs for residences, aircraft, even $70,000 in deductions for hairstyling costs during his time on The Apprentice. President Trump has often said statements like this. I have great business sense. I made a lot of money and I had great success. So I've had great success. By the way, really successful. But the Times also reports that most of his core businesses report losing millions, like his Washington Hotel. It reportedly lost more than 55 million since it opened four years ago. Putting the president's personal debt at $421 million, Money coming due in a few years. The paper noting that if Trump is reelected, his lenders could be placed in the unprecedented position of weighing whether to foreclose on a sitting president. 
President Trump's insisted the report is inaccurate. Well, first of all, I've paid a lot, and I've paid a lot of state income taxes, too. But the Biden campaign has already pounced, releasing this ad highlighting working class people who, according to this investigation, have paid more federal income taxes than the president. The Biden team has also created a tax calculator where you too can go in and compare how much you've paid in taxes to how much Donald Trump has reportedly paid. This is clearly going to be a focal point for the Biden campaign going forward. Alex Brache, ABC News, Cleveland. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Take a live look outside right now with live cam. A very nice 72 degrees. Great way to start the Monday. Yeah, I said, you know, kind of like carve a pumpkin weather, yes. you know, maybe. Pump pumpkin spice latte yes. weather, maybe. Yes. Well, that started like two months ago. <laughs> at least for me, right? <laughs> well, at least it feels yeah. like you should have a pumpkin spice latte outside. And I wanted to start with some more good news. And this good news involves the aquifer. So let's go ahead and take a look at the aquifer levels. They have been steadily rising above that stage one water restriction line, that top red line that you see today, currently sitting at 663 feet above sea level. And we have good news. Stage one water restrictions are no longer in effect as early as tomorrow morning. So that's good. Uh, and you might be wondering, well, where's the rain been? Well, we've seen a decent amount of rain during September. We've seen over three inches of rainfall. As for rain in our near future, does not look good. For the next seven to 10 days, it should be pretty dry. Now, our almanac today is a little interesting. The high temperature, 80 degrees, that occurred at 328 in the morning before we saw the cold front move through that cold front moved through. We dipped down into the 60s, saw a very thin line of showers didn't amount to much. In fact, nothing reported at the airport. Uh, and then it's been it was a really steady day of winds from the north gusting up to 40 miles per hour, and we did have a good mixture of sun and clouds. We've still got some clouds out there uh, late this evening, uh, and those clouds are going to eventually dissipate by the start of the day tomorrow. Those clouds, however, are going to act like a little bit of a blanket and keep our temperatures from falling uh, really, really cold tonight, but instead we will be nice and cool and crisp in the morning hours in the 50s. 72 right now in San Antonio at 69 in Hondo, 64 in Kerrville, 63 in Rock Springs. That cool, crisp fall air already in place. Now winds, which like I said, were gusting up to 40 miles per hour, have calmed down quite a bit. We're seeing a wind from the north at about 5 to 10 miles per hour, and that'll continue throughout the evening. Evening. Dry air in place as well. Dew points falling into the 30s. Anytime a dew point is in the 30s, I like to call that chapstick weather. It's going to be a little too dry for comfort outside, but still nice out, outside tomorrow. And speaking of tomorrow, this is how we'll start off in the upper 40s in the Hill Country. 49 in Rock Springs, 49 in Kerrville, 48 in Fredericksburg. We're going to go with a morning low of 55 here in San Antonio, 57 in New Braunfels, 57 in Del Rio, and 55 in Eagle Pass. But if you think it's going to be cool all day, You'd be wrong. It's in fact going to be a little bit on the warmer side in the afternoon. High temperatures in the 80s for all of us. 83 downtown San Antonio, 81 in Lotus, 80 in Leon Springs, 82 at Stone Oak for the high and 82 in New Braunfels. Up in the Hill Country, temperatures might stay in the 70s, but still a nice, comfortable, but warm day in the afternoon. And the reason why we're going to see that huge temperature jump from 55 to 83. Look at that total sunshine all day tomorrow. We are still going to have a wind from the north that about 10 to 15 miles per hour and that low humidity will stick with us not only tomorrow but all throughout the week. This is a look at morning low temperatures. Perfect for having a cup of coffee outside to start your day or maybe going on that morning walk or run uh, with your pup or your family. It's going to be a very nice uh, week ahead and again total sunshine. No chance for rain in the seven day forecast. Mornings in the 50s. Afternoons warm even getting up to 90 degrees on Thursday but we should be able to see a really pleasant week and humidity should work its way back into the forecast by Sunday and Monday, but it's not going to be oppressively humid like it was this past weekend. Steve, EC. Love the low humidity. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Coming up, an officer comes across a potentially sticky oh. situation. The rescue op operation coming up next. Tomorrow will kick off the first of the presidential debates as the election approaches campaigns intensifying as well as emotions. 
Tomorrow on GMSA, the simple tips to consider to help keep you feeling a little less overwhelmed this election season. Well, check this out. Officers coming to the rescue of a skunk in Massachusetts. The little guy got his head stuck in a container and could not help but to walk in circles. Well, Officer Eric Hanley came across the animal over the weekend. After a few tries, he was able to safely and quickly help out the skunk and make a clean getaway. I don't know who ran Ooh. faster, the officer or the, the skunk. skunk. Yeah. Wow. All right, one man making a major find in Arkansas ever since his second grade field trip to Diamond State Park. Kevin Kennard has been searching for diamonds. Now at 33, he's managed to find the second largest diamond in the park's history, a nine carat wow. diamond about the size of a marble. He found it on Labor Day. Kennard says it's unique that he found a 9.07 carat diamond on September 7th or 9-7. That's amazing. I didn't, I what mean, a lucky find, right? I would have just thought, oh, it's just called Diamond yeah. Park. I wouldn't think that they actually had, had diamonds there. there. It's pretty awesome. Uh, we're going to have pretty awesome morning temperatures, too. Temperatures in the 50s uh, throughout the morning. Afternoons in the 80s, near 90 degrees. But low humidity to the rescue. It's going to feel great. Hope you get some time outdoors. Really nice weather of the next few days. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. That's it for the night beat. GMSA at 430. Good night.